thank you guys for uh, for coming out tonight. Um, it's the first time I'm doing a webcast, so it might be a little bit of a different experience for me. So uh, and for you guys, I think you're in for a wild ride. Um, but all right, let's see how it goes. So uh, the idea behind today is um, sort of just looking at really the value of having a trading plan. Um, so I want to start with stuff that we've already covered in previous presentations because I think this is, I don't know, maybe my fifth or sixth power hour and all of them are sort of uh, complementary to one another, if not um, cumulative, but definitely complementary. So some of the things we looked at um, in previous presentations were uh, daily routines for sort of intraday and active traders, practical trading setups and, and trading rules building blocks to trading strategies, uh, some things about trading psychology. And there was a keen focus on um, uh, risk management in one of the previous ones as well, where we looked at the ATR uh, times two trading stop loss methodology and so on. So um, those presentations are obviously available on uh, the Just One Lap website as well as YouTube channel. And I've put them as well as the slides um, on the Herenia website under presentations on the top menu, you'll see there's a presentations tab or presentations button that you can press or you can just use the URL over there. So um, obviously, you know, we'd highly recommend that you go back and look at those previous um, presentations and work through them because some of them are, are hopefully, uh, you know, relatively useful to you. Um, there are a couple of disclaimers that we sort of have to start with um, and there's a, there's a bunch of them throughout this, I guess. Um, but firstly, you know, something that we have to acknowledge, particularly, I don't, I don't know how many of you guys um, are, you know, new entrants into the trading world or have been around for a while, but those that have been around for a while will surely be able to, you know, will surely know that the success that you have in the market is completely your own responsibility, right? There's no nice way of saying it. Um, it is literally what you put in is what you get out. Uh, a lot of people look for easy money. Um, or look to trading as a, a quick solution to a you know kind of financial problem that they're having and trading is absolutely not that it is a discipline that takes many years to master um, you know one that I still haven't mastered I'm still learning every day right um, and it's a lot of hard work uh, to to be able to do this correctly and you wouldn't believe how many people in the last couple of weeks since we're all on lockdown have come and said, hey, I want to open a trading account. I think, you know, now I've got the time to to have a go at this and make a success of it. I've got three weeks of lockdown. Okay, now five weeks of lockdown to master this. And, you know, in reality, most of those people, you have to say to them, uh, you know, well, look, realistic expectations, it's not going to happen that quickly. And maybe it's not a good idea that you that you get involved, right? Um, so the things we're going to be looking at today, uh, looking at today, there's two basic um, lessons that we'll be pulling out of today or you know basic principles that are the most important one trading needs to have a risk-based approach um, you always have to think with your risk hat on we tend to think about how much money we can make very quickly but the reality is we have to always play defense and always make sure that we are in a situation in which we will be able to survive for the next trade you know uh, I think I tweeted it a little while ago he who screams and runs away lives to scream another day, right? Um, and that's just because the market got too volatile for me and I went into cash and I haven't really taken a trade on the JSE, um, you know, in the CFD book for what, almost three weeks now. Facilities have been too high. I've been looking at a couple of stuff and plotting around here and there with equities, but not really um, taking significant, any kind of significant risk just simply because, um, it just the mark the conditions haven't been right for me and yes you know people think that the high volatility markets is a trader's dream but it can also very quickly turn into a nightmare right um and the second most important and probably the most important one is that process is uh what determines success right so process 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 you need to have uh, a sort of a routine or a process and in some of the previous presentations we obviously have looked at uh, some of those daily routines um, but we'll talk a little bit more in, about processes of identifying trades and stuff um, today. So things we're going to be looking at today is obviously selecting the right instruments and asset classes to trade. Um, a lot of people chase after you know the hot things to trade, forex and this and that, whatever, because 
um, binary options and whatever else is being marketed really well on the internet. Um, so we'll be looking at you know, what you should be trading and why you should be trading it um, and how you should be selecting those, right? We're also going to be talking about just basically taking trades, uh, a little bit around um, you know, some of the some of the strategic things or strategy type things that go into into taking trades and making trading decisions, uh, and then formulating a trading plan that works for you, right? Um, and then enforcing discipline um, is made a little bit easier if you are based in a routine, right? So trading discipline is something that is a um, you know is a key topic in a lot of talks and a lot of people talk about uh, i mean i'm sure you guys all know that trading discipline is one of those things that um or discipline when it comes to trading is one of those things that either make or break you right you have to be very disciplined if you want to do this successfully and one of the ways to stay disciplined is to have a solid or set routine of how you do things or a process of how you you do things um, and that helps you stay uh stay disciplined right so the major takeaway from today uh is just that trading is something that needs to be done slowly we often get caught up in the excitement of taking you know 10,000 trades a day and this fast-paced lifestyle um, and the way that it's advertised and stuff but the truth is that if you do it slowly and you do it you know with a considered plan uh, and a solid process then you are in a better position to actually do it successfully the idea is you don't ever really want it to stress you out right um all right, so what, what, what did we trade? This is, let's uh, sort of get into this. Um, so things that you have to consider before you decide what you have to trade. There's obviously different asset classes and there's different instrument types. Uh, and we'll look at some of them in a second. So you have to decide first, you know, you have to ask yourself a number of, of really important questions. One is how much risk are you, uh, are you able to take? How much risk can I, you know, reasonably take with the capital that I have to trade with? The next thing is how much time are you willing or not necessarily willing to but able to dedicate to markets every single day um you know if it's 10 minutes a day maybe intraday trading is not for you right um if it's uh 10 hours a day maybe you can consider intraday trading um also you have to be relatively honest with yourself not relatively honest with yourself you have to be very honest with yourself about how much you actually know um and how much experience you actually have you know because a lot of the time very inexperienced uh, newer traders uh you know go towards things like binary options which is actually an incredibly complex instrument right but because it's sort of sold to us really easily um we flock towards those things and we're just not experienced enough to actually uh, be trading in knockout warrants and, and binary options and that kind of stuff and uh you know have you have you accepted the truth and the truth is that there is no magical strategy works that works and makes millions very quickly. You know, these guys on YouTube that say, oh, with these three steps, you're going to make $10 billion in like five seconds flat. You know, they wouldn't be making YouTube videos and selling courses and doing all sorts of other things if those three steps were really that easy and really worked, right? So there's no magical formula uh, that you can buy from someone that's going to do this for you. You have to create your own strategy um and if it doesn't work you're the only one that there is to blame we can't blame any kind of outside or external um factor for our success or failure our success or failure in this game lies completely on the decisions that we've made right we can't control what the market does but we can control how we re react to it and if we don't react correctly it leaves us on the side of the road right and that is unfortunately one of the truths of trading and that's also actually what makes trading so awesome is that it's one of the only things in the world where we are completely in control of our own of our own destinies right so okay so um some hard to swallow pills you have no idea what you're actually trading which means you're taking risk that you don't understand and that you can't afford right um you got to ask yourself are you trading the sexy stuff you know i'm trading forex i'm trading binary options i'm trading uh you know all sorts of otc derivatives that i don't actually understand but hey man these are the things that everybody talks about it's the, the guys in rosebank that rented a porsche for the day taking photos telling everyone they're forex traders selling courses it's the stuff they ask you to you know push you push you into trading um 
when you actually don't have any clue what what the actual underlying instrument is so uh, as mentioned before you must take a risk-based approach to trading and that means a risk-based approach to selecting the different asset classes in which you trade and the different instruments in which you trade uh, so you need to understand you know what influences the price movements of the underlying asset class so a commodity like gold for example versus a currency versus a equity versus a bond right each one of those things are driven by different market fundamentals and different factors that drive the price um, as well as what are the the rules or, or or functional sort of operational stuff around the instrument that you're trading are you trading a future or a CFD or a warrant or a uh, or an option, right? And also, there are things that influence the pricing of those particular instrument types as well. And do you really understand those those uh, those influences? Uh, like, for example, if you trade a single stock future, uh, the contract price is generally slightly higher than the spot market price, and that's because it has interest and time decay and the contract loses value the closer it gets to spot and the same applies with stuff like options right um so so you have to you have to first understand these things before you can start trading them and i, I think a lot of people have an issue where they don't necessarily really understand the stuff that they're trading um they're just trading it because you know it's the stuff they've seen or the stuff that their broker offers them and it's not necessarily the stuff that's that's in their own best interest to trade so we'll look at some of the different instruments that there are available to trade so you've got basically what are they the five different uh primary primary different types right so you've got spot markets you've got futures contracts for difference which are very similar to futures um and then options and then over the counter uh cfds and other derivatives right so starting with spot markets, these are generally instruments where you buy them directly on the exchange. So this is like shares that you buy and hold for the next 20 years or a bond that you buy and you put, you know forget that you have it and it pays you interest every three months or um, you know physical gold, for example, you go buy a gold coin or a gold bar or a Krugerrand, right? So these are the spot markets. These are the actual underlying assets. These are generally long only um you know you can't be you can't have a negative equity position uh, or a negative gold position is you can only do that with a derivative um and they're best for long-term investment um you know so a buying and holding kind of stuff um or you know they're also very good for getting access to markets without having to take excessive risk so you can't put down 10 rand and buy 100 rands worth of stuff because you're buying the actual underlying thing. So if you only have 10 rand, you can only buy 10 rands worth of stuff, right? So spot marks is generally the best place to start actually um, for people who can't actually really afford to take a lot of risk. So these are the real markets where the real underlying assets are being traded. Futures is then a future contract or a contract that you buy on a predetermined amount of stock or bonds or commodity or whatever the underlying asset is right uh, and this contract expires at a set date in future and then the underlying asset is deliverable uh, when that futures contract expires and you can then trade in this contract you can buy and sell these contracts right um, usually here you get between sort of 10 and 15 times gearing so if you look at something like the all z which is the all share index future top 40 index future uh, you've got about 15 times gearing on those contracts, as where with single stock futures, you usually have around 10 times gearing, which means you put down a 10% deposit. Uh, so for every 10 rand, you can buy 100 rands worth of stuff. So things to watch out for here is obviously you have to stay mindful of how much exposure you're actually taking. If you have 100,000 rand, uh, you can, you know, take about one and a half million rands worth of exposure if, if you're trading the Aussie, for example, but that's not necessarily wise right um simply because the amount of risk you're taking compared to the amount of capital you have just is is skewed right um and futures can be traded on pretty much all underlying asset classes including indices right contact for difference work very similarly to futures um these are basically um perpetual contracts that don't have set expiry dates every three months in the future uh, and you pay interest rate on them daily. They usually trade at the spot market price because the interest portion is charged 
um, daily and is not worked into the futures contract price like it is with the future. Um, and they're available on pretty much all underlying asset classes. Um, you know, you can get you can get CFDs on on ETFs, for example. You can get CFDs on gold. You can get CFDs on currencies or stocks or anything really. Um, and the, ex the exposure or the gearing here is generally between sort of seven times and twelve times gearing, depending on um, you know the the liquidity of the underlying stock and the underwriter's willingness to take risk. Usually, the underwriter is a big institution like a bank. Um, whose money you're basically trading with um, and then um, so if you take for example one of the service providers that Arena uses for uh, CFDs we're trading in the real market we're trading in the spot market um, where the purchases we're doing is we're doing with the bank's money right and then we put a margin deposit down for that and the bank then charges us interest on financing that position over a period of time so um you have to still be mindful of the the amount of gearing that you take because again you can take 10 or 12 times as big positions uh, as what you have money but again it's not necessarily uh, wise then uh you can look at something the next one is options so options is a is a very interesting thing and this is somewhere where i'm only really starting to play now still relatively small well very small um and just kind of feeling my way around it and, and, and learning by doing, if I can say that. Um, I have to admit so far I'm enjoying it. Um, and uh, uh, it seems to be, it seems to suit my trading, my personality quite well and my trading style quite well. Uh, so generally you can get, a, you know, it's a hundred times gearing. So you buy a contract on a on hundred shares at a time. Uh, the cool thing about them is that they have defined and limited risk. So for example, you can buy an option for 60 cents so times 10 that'll be 60 dollars uh, and if you get it wrong well you lose 60 dollars right uh, if you get it right however you can maybe sell them for six dollars or seven dollars a contract times 100 uh, you can make 10 times your money or five times your money or whatever the the return is that you can make but you know that your risk is absolutely capped at what you paid for the option so it's kind of like insurance right um, downside is it's very complex pricing because they have all sorts of other things like implied volatility, um, you know, time decay, a whole bunch of different things that come into the pricing models of options. So it can be somewhat difficult to, to understand. Also, they're only really practical to trade in the US. Um, you can trade them locally, but the liquidity here is not as great as it is in the US. So the option pricing is, is a lot more uh, expensive and the premiums that you have to pay is a lot bigger. So for a lot of local options contracts, you've got to put down like 500,000 rands worth of margin for one for one contract and you know not a lot of people can afford to say well oops i got it wrong i dropped half a million bucks right so um it's a lot more practical to trade in the us just because the market is so much bigger and you can get options for you know five us cents sometimes um i mean odds are if you're paying five cents for an option it's you're not going to make any money on it but um you know it is a lot more uh, practical and easier to trade uh, and again options are traded on pretty much any underlying asset class right options on coffee options on uh you know bonds and equities and indices and pretty much anything or even the weather um which is which is pretty interesting then there's the over-the-counter cfds and, and other derivatives so i guess the thing here is the over-the-counter situation so usually here they'll give you 50 times gearing some brokers offering 500 times gearing like ridiculous uh, amounts of of gearing that they'll give you but what you're doing here essentially is you're trading against the house. I never actually put the, the second little close bracket there. I noticed now for the first time. Um, but uh, so what happens here is instead of trading, you know, through a bank or, or through an institution where they buy the actual underlying stock and write the contract for difference uh, contract to you, which they then give you and you give them the margin deposit, right? When you're trading over the counter, um, you're usually trading with an institution who kind of, you know, will make a market available and buy from anyone who wants to sell and sell to anyone who wants to buy and then say, cool, we've got a net position of, you know, long 100, so they'll hold 100 to be hedged, um, you know, 100 underlying shares to be hedged. But in the meanwhile, they've got, you know, 1,000 people, 1,000 shares long and 900 shares short, and they've only hedged with the underlying 100, which is the difference. And when the clients lose money, 
they lose their money to the market maker or the the ot broker in that case so while they offer very often very good rates um you know in terms of brokerage rates and massive gearing um it's not necessarily always the wisest thing to be trading it's well at least i prefer to trade dma right but again otc derivatives basically available on almost every asset class um then there's a bunch of different asset classes that we can trade as well right so our goal is to evaluate which combination of asset classes and instruments we should be trading depending on where we are in our trading journey if we can put it that way so the different asset classes really are equities uh, which is just normal shares and companies come with a variety of rights uh the, well the three primary ones perpetual claim right to earn in uh the sharing a right to share in the earnings of the company and uh um you know the right to vote on matters pertaining to the business so you become a real shareholder in the business and you own a real stake of the company if you buy equities right um commodities so there are two basic types of commodities hard commodities soft commodities hard commodities are basically anything that needs to be mined or extracted so metals oil coal that kind of stuff soft commodities are generally agricultural products wheat coffee pork you know, orange juice whatever right so um again these things are driven by supply and demand dynamics that might not necessarily drive the, the equity market um, then there's bonds which is basically debt obligations you get government bonds corporate bonds um junk bonds you know a whole bunch of different things and they generally uh, are redeemable for uh, you know after a period of time let's say by a 20 year bond you pay a million bucks for it and 20 years from now you get your million bucks back uh, but in the interim you've received quarterly or biannual interest payments or coupon payments um, which is then how you you generate your return from the bond or of course you can buy and sell the bond as the price fluctuates um, and then there's currencies or forex so these are generally traded in pairs so the rand versus the dollar or the euro versus the dollar uh, it's generally just one currency versus another uh, you can do that in both spot obviously as well as a derivative or otc or cfd or whatever the case is uh, spot you would physically buy actual dollars and then sell them later back for rands and then switch them for dollars again and that's what you would be doing if you're trading spot currency right um then i'm not really sure if this counts as an asset class but i've i've, I've counted as an asset class exchange traded funds or notes so these are basically collective investment schemes i'm sure everybody who who uh you know reads and follows just on lap knows what an etf is right so it's an index that's being tracked usually um with a, a unitized sort of collective investment that trades on the exchange so think of something like the satrix 40 it mirrors the top 40 index uh, and it is a fund that holds all the shares in the top 40 index in the same proportion and then you can buy and sell that as if it was a share right um, and they composed of whatever the underlying asset is if it's an index or a commodity or a bond or a currency so indices and, and that would probably be etfs as where commodities, currencies, and bonds would probably be ETNs, right? Um, but to me, they're pretty much the same thing. So what should you be trading is one of the bigger questions. So what I've done is I've made a little table here looking at uh, three different levels of, um, of traders, right? So the new trader, um, you know, you're in one of three positions. You either don't have much to lose, and there's no shame in that. I mean there's no um you know being risk averse and conservative is not bad everybody starts with a hundred bucks right um nobody starts off with a hundred million rand account it takes years to build up to i mean okay 100 million is maybe an extreme example but do you know what i mean like it it really takes a long time for us to build up the capital that we need so while you are a newer trader and you can't really afford to lose much you should be trading spot markets only right and the markets that you can trade in uh, or the asset classes that it would, I would recommend at least that you trade in would be equities, ETFs, bonds and commodities. So don't touch Forex uh, and only trade the stuff that you know you can buy and hold for a long time if you if you get it wrong, at least while you're learning the ropes and while you can't afford to take much risk, right? If you can take sort of, uh, you know, over 100,000 Rand that you have to to learn with, if you can put it that way, especially if you're in the new trader category, 
then you can maybe trade spot markets as well as CFDs, but still only in these in these asset classes. If you've got more than 100 or more than 500,000 rand to trade with and you're new, well, still only spot markets and CFDs and still only these, these asset classes, right? Um, if you're moderately experienced, you've been trading for a year or two or three. Um, again, if you can't lose much, spot markets only, right? Um, not really much changes here to tell you the truth, except now if you're moderately experienced, you can start maybe getting involved in a little bit of Forex as well. Um, and you can start trading futures as well. Because the reason I say futures is more for the moderately experienced trader that rather than the beginner is just because the contract sizes are generally slightly bigger. As CFD, you can buy on one or two or 10 shares is where a future uh, is generally a contract of an, of, with an underlying value of 100 shares, right? So um, trading, you know, Naspash, for example, uh, is not so easy if you have to, if you're forced to buy a minimum of 100 at a time, as where on a CFD, you could maybe buy 12 or 10 or eight or whatever the case is, right? Um, if you're a very experienced trader, so you've been at it for a couple of years, again, if you can't lose much, you're trading spot markets. Um, if you've got about 100 grand to play with or more, then you can maybe include futures, spot markets, CFDs. Uh, and if you've got you know, a, a significantly big enough portfolio, you can start trading all the various different uh, options that there are available. And only then, really, for the first time, am I saying you can trade OTC, um, because at this stage, you should be um, you know, experienced enough to really understand what the risk is um, and how the pricing works and, you know, what the downsides and upsides of OTC trading is. Um, and then it's only really the first time you can, one, one truly understand the risk and two, uh, be in a position where you can actually afford to take it, right? Um, and then again, you know, the different, the different asset classes that you can trade, you can now trade basically all of them because you're a more experienced trader. Right? Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's it's a bit random, but there's a cat fight happening outside the window. So I hope you guys um, empathize with whichever one of the cats just uh, caught a clump on the side of the head. In any case, okay. So um, making your own plan. So this is again a slide from well, not exactly, but this is something that I covered once in a in a YouTube video, uh, and something that we've spoken about in previous um, previous power hours. So this is looking at basically what a trading strategy would look like. Um, there's a couple of key things here. As you can see, there's a lot of risk management elements to it. So there's a stop loss methodology. There's an exposure rule. Um, there's more risk management stuff, stuff to watch out for, stuff that you get you out of trades, for example. Um, there's an edge identification method. So how does my strategy work? What am I trading? What are my entry criteria? What are my exit criteria? Uh, and this is basically how my my edge works. So I must have certain parameters before I'm allowed to trade, and I have sort of things that are nice to have, but not necessarily um, absolutely important. I think I'm going to open for questions here if anybody has one, um, because this thing it can generally be relatively complicated. The idea here is not necessarily to say to you, this is a strategy, go and use it. I'm not going to go into too much detail into exactly what all this stuff here means. I think I've covered this in one of the previous presentations already. But the idea here is to show you the kind of structure that you need behind uh, the creation of a strategy and the kind of things that you have to think about. I didn't mention instrument selection, right, and universe creation. So what am I trading and why? What asset classes, what instruments? Um, so you have to think first, risk management, what's my edge? What am I trading, right? Um, and then more risk management in the end. All right, I'm gonna move on. Um, so one of the things, I'm not gonna go into too much details, but one of, this, one of the strategies that I've been working with for the last, uh, I don't know, a little bit, maybe a year or so, um, is basically a momentum-based strategy. And basic principles that um, this is based on is that you need to have, or I need to have, multiple confirmations before I'm willing to take a trade. So I'm looking for pattern breakouts with two measures of uh, momentum. So I'm looking at a stochastic and a MACD, uh, as well as relative strength comparison to, uh, you know, compared to a, a benchmark, um, how strong that particular instrument or stock or whatever it is that I'm trading is in comparison to the underlying benchmark that I'm comparing against. 
uh, and then I also want a break of resistance before I have uh, a valid entry signal. I'll show you some examples of that um, in a second. Uh, also, I'm going to brag a bit <laughs> of some good trades. I'm not going to show you any losers today because, hey, that's not. A <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, anyway, so what this basically means is I want at least three signals before I can take a trade, right? Sometimes uh, there are five triggers that you wait for. Sometimes there are six. But if there's five, I need at least three. If there's six, I need at least four. Um, triggers or signals before I'm really to, uh, ready to take the trade and relative performance compared to the benchmark that I'm trading against um, or measuring against will very often dictate whether or not I can take the trade because I don't want to be taking um, trades that are against the relative performance. I'll explain that in a second or so. Uh, and as a general rule of thumb, when trading against the trend, uh, trade half size, right? So let's say, for example, you're using a 2% risk model you're willing to risk 2% of your portfolio for every uh, trade that you get wrong. When you're trading against the trend, you reduce that to one. So you basically halve your position size, right? Um, and it's just, you know, that think that thesis of risk-based approach, think about risk first before thinking about how much money you're going to make, right? Um, and yeah, obviously everyone's strategy is going to be different. You have to create your own. This is just one that's been working for me. Um, and also, just another note, I mean, strategies are relatively fluid and dynamic, so you don't necessarily always stick to the same strategy all the time. You, uh, uh, you have to sort of, you have to keep adapting and keep learning. And as you learn new things and find new methods, you have to, um, you have to adapt and, and move with the market, right? No one thing is going to work forever. So, okay, so to give you an idea, I'm going to use the mouse here. Uh, this was a setup on the RAND um some time ago at the time that this was published this uh last candle here had not closed above the trigger line so it actually didn't give a trigger at this stage uh the break of resistance um the break of resistance requirement wasn't necessarily uh you know hadn't triggered but you can see there's a bit of a flat top triangle situation there and your stochastic gave two signals basically first was the the signal line crossing over the uh, stochastic line and the second was the stochastic then moving up through 20 and then eventually through 50 right so that would be signal one and two over there and then i would count the stochastic breaking up above 80 as uh, as a third signal uh, because as you can see the stochastic can sometimes hit through 80 and bounce around above that level for a long time before the stock actually pulls down this is actually a currency not a stock uh, another signal here was the movement of the MACD up through the zero line, so that counts as a signal, and the movement of the, uh, the you know, the crossover of the trigger line, or the signal line and the MACD line, uh, which is basically just a little moving average on the MACD, uh, and that would count as another signal. And then uh, in this particular case, this negative strength indicator at the bottom here means absolutely nothing, because uh, there's no real benchmark that you can compare this to, so I was just too lazy to remove it <laughs> from my chart setup. Um, so basically, my signals are basically just based on momentum here and a break of this resistance. And if you have a look at how well that played out, kapow, the trade that you thought would never work because the movement is just absolutely too huge, took, what, four weeks to hit target from 16.24 to 18.44. So this is a weekly chart, right? Um, another example with that would be Sasol. We've got basically a bear flag situation here. This bear flag targeted 80 Rand 55, it seemed absolutely insane that that would happen. Uh, but what we had here was a failure for the MACD, sorry, for the stochastic to get above 80. It basically fell underneath 80. It crossed over, that gave us a signal. It crossed below the 20, that gave us another signal. We had a failure to breach above zero on the MACD. We had a crossover, uh, which was a signal, um, you know, a sell signal. And then this time the relative strength comparison versus the top 40 index, we can see it's been a strong underperformer for a long time. It kind of briefly tried to trend outperform, couldn't make it and continue to, to underperform. And then the break of this uh, of this bear flag was a signal to, to take the trade. And I think we all know how that one worked out. Um, it actually worked out relatively well. It's, it's funny because when this was happening, when the chart was telling us to go short, we didn't know, you know what was gonna happen. We didn't know what the fundamental story was, but, in momentum, uh, you know, using the process of identifying trades and sticking to the rules that we've created, we've managed to, to catch a very, very nice trade. 
Um, another, op another example here is a company called Medtronic. Um, this was a bit of a fundamental, you know, the reason we found the stock, I guess, was a fundamental thing. Um, they make ventilators uh, in the US, so interesting play. But we can see that, uh, you know, we're setting up for a potential entry here. So from a stochastic perspective, we're kind of we're looking to go above 20. We've just sort of had a signal line, uh, stochastic line crossover. We still don't have a signal here, but eventually, um, you know, we did get a crossover and a signal. We did get a solid one, two confirmation signal here. Uh, and we had, if you could draw a little trend line down, you could see there was a break of the trend line as well. And bang, it was a, a it was a beautiful trade. This is actually a trade that we took on uh, making use of options. So there's two expiries. One we closed, uh, I think it was yesterday, or Tuesday, I can't remember. Um, and the other one is still open with a, with a slightly higher strike and a, and a later expiry. Um, and then here is another good example of uh, basically how, um, of how like this little momentum based strategy has just sort of been uh, relatively successful. Um, you know, when we sort of saw this move down here, we had our first signal, which is your signal crossover, second signal through 80, third signal through 20. Uh, we have signal crossover, move through zero, uh, and a break of this trend line here that got you in short and you managed to, uh, you know, you would have managed to catch this. And we, we actually did. We were, um, we did pretty well on this trade as well. And then as you can see now, we had another crossover here, which is one signal, two signal, three signal, four signal, to be long and it was quite a strong move up and again here the uh, underlying relative strength um, I'm comparing to the top 40 index here so it's not necessarily relevant for this particular chart but you know th this is just necessarily this is just really an example of how having a process um, is really important in terms of how you do how do you identify setups how do you evaluate setups uh, and what set of rules do you use to consistently trade uh, setups um, and that really is, is what adds value to trading right um, so the idea is you have to make you have to make your own trading plan so you have to formulate a trading plan that works for you uh, and is, is speaks to where you are in your trading journey you know a lot of people come uh, with trading strategies that they learn somewhere where you know they want to see 20 different indicators and 17,000 different moving averages and you know the stars need to align and the weather needs to be perfect and you know all sorts of stuff when all you really need is you know two indicators right um well i don't know all i really need is two indicators necessarily it's it's just um a lot of the time we ever complicate stuff and we, we don't really um you know we think that the more stuff we add to the charts the better it's going to work what we have to do is we have to acknowledge how much we know and recognize that there is a lot that we don't know right uh you have to then identify the things that you don't know because for a long time we don't know what we don't know so we must identify what we don't know and we have to study up on those things and it's self-study there's no paid course uh, there's no youtube guru that's going to teach you this stuff you have to read the books and the books are expensive right um but they're worth it they're worth every cent there are some fantastic books out there a really good one that i could recommend um which focuses a lot on back testing and sort of uh body of evidence type uh you know indicator uh, uh stuff where you build models to to take trades is a book called uh being right or making money it is a fantastic book um it's really it's like a couple of hundred dollars or whatever but it is really really worth it um it's helped me a lot and there's i mean there's endless resources out there you just have to put in the effort to find them you know um so in any case basic things you have to think about when formulating your own plan is is what time frame are you going to trade are you going to trade intraday or overnight slash swing trading uh, or are you going to do long-term investing uh, these things are are obviously very important i mean if you're a long-term investor this momentum based strategy that i showed you is not going to help you because it's going to respond too quickly and get you in and out of trades every couple of days or every couple of weeks and you're wanting to hold this stuff for 10 years right so then you're going to have to look at something different as where this strategy that I'm using on a daily chart, you can't apply to a five minute candle because it's going to give you too many signals and whoopsaw, right? So you have to consider what your time frame is that you're going to trade. Uh, also the instrument that you're going to be trading. So 
how much exposure do you want to take? Do you, do you even want to take gearing? Um, can you afford to take the risk? And do you understand the instrument that it is that you're trading in? And then you also have to consider the underlying asset class. Do you understand what drives the asset? Do you understand what drives the gold price? Do you understand what drives the oil price? Do you understand what drives you know, equity prices? Um, so what asset class are you trading? Um, and how, you know, what are the things that influence that asset class? A book on that would be Intermarket Analysis. It's also a great book. Um, and also back testing of your method, you know, come up with a method, go through the charts, you know, one by one, spend the day, spend the hours going through them and testing. Okay, one, two, three, four, five signals, this happens. One, two, three, four, five signals, this happens. Okay, seven out of 10 times it works or two out of 10 times it works, whatever the case is, but you won't know whether or not the strategy works unless you test it. And the only way to do that is to use historic data and to back test the stuff, right? And also, is it a simple strategy? Because if you've got 50 different indicators, to try and help you, uh, you know, make a trading decision. Odds are, it's overcomplicated, right? Um, so you have to ask yourself, am I overcomplicating this? And how do I boil it down to just the simplest, easiest number of variables that um, that can give me sort of a reasonable expectation that that whatever trade I'm about to take is going to work. So the key here to all of this is really just the process, right? Um, so one of the trading processes that we have in the in the sort of trading team at Arena, if you you can call it that, um, is you know as a collective, everybody identifies different opportunities, right? Um, but you identify an opportunity, uh, we then evaluate that opportunity. We first look at sort of potential uh, fundamental risks or catalysts. Uh, you know, we want to trade banks. Our earnings coming out. We want to trade retailers. What about retail sales? Um, what about uh, you know consumer sentiment, economic calendar stuff like uh, jobless data, that kind of stuff? Are there any fundamental catalysts on the horizon or looming stuff, dividends, uh, ex-div, that kind of stuff that's coming up that could potentially impact the pricing of this particular stock or instrument or whatever it is that we're you know spotting the opportunity in? If it sort of passes that and say, okay, cool, you know, there's nothing really that's too risky on the uh, on the horizon, then we look at the actual setup. And we say, do we have a clear risk reward, a clear entry and exit? Is there a good risk reward ratio? Is it, you know, better than one to two? If it's less than one to two, should we reduce position size in order to compensate for the additional risk? Um, you know, is that really sort of a valid setup, and is there a very clear place for us to get in and get out if we're right and you know or wrong? Um, once we have a planned trade, we wait around for the confirmation, right? So a lot of the time with the weekly game plan stuff. Uh, a lot of the time those are planned trades um, and I mean about half of them don't even trigger most of the time. Uh, some of them do. Um, some of them are wrong. Some of them stop out. Some of them are right, you know, so it really depends. You Once you've planned, you now have to, to wait for it. And if you've missed it, you've missed it, man. Don't chase it, right? Um, once you're in the trade, you have to continuously monitor this trade every day, once or twice a day. Just have, you know, have a look. Has something fundamentally changed? Uh, or some sort of news catalyst came out or, or, or fundamental catalyst came out that significantly changes the picture uh, of this stock uh, or of this particular asset that I'm trading. Um, has it reached a stop loss or its target? Has the momentum significantly shifted in a different direction? So we're long the thing uh, and we think that it's going to continue to go up, but momentum suddenly wanes very quickly. Uh, that could be a reason to get out of the trade, even though it's not at target, right? Um, it was something drastic in the in the macro environment changed. For example, I don't know, the US printed a couple of trillion dollars, for example. Um, so these are all things that we have to continuously keep an eye out for and monitor and evaluate whether or not we're in the right against on a, uh, or not on a, on, a, on a continuous basis, right? Um, and then something that, uh, I don't know, something that I'm learning, right? Uh, it's not something, it's just something that I kind of picked up on now, is knowing when to stay out. So one of the things to stay out is, um, you know, when the environment is too confusing for you, get out. When the environment is too volatile for you, get out. Um, this, just for perspective on uh, volatility, is the VIX index uh, or the, the, the volatility index um, from essentially the 2008 crash. As indicated by the giant spikes here on the left hand side um, and 
what's happened recently. So the VIX actually printed higher than it did in uh, 2008, 2009 financial crisis. So that gives you a fair indication of how wild the market has been. And I'll be very honest with you, when the VIX was at around 80, I went into cash. Not all my positions were in the, not in the money, not all of them were at target. I just closed everything because it just got literally too wild for me, right? The lesson that I learned is that when VIX goes above 50, consider not taking any new trades, right? Um, everybody's going to say, well, you know, when the volatility is great, you know, real traders are going to make a lot of money. It's the conditions they love. The number of real traders I know that have been carried out in the last couple of weeks would scare you, right? Um, the real, real traders are the ones that survive. Um, and if that means that if things get a bit hairy um, and you have to set a rule for yourself as a general rule, if VIX is above 50, I go to cash. I don't do any more short-term trading and I put my buy hat on for long-term investments and equities and ungeared stuff. That is maybe a, a, a good way of, um, of managing risk or, uh, you know, knowing exactly when to, to participate and when not to participate. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. Petri, really appreciate. It. I want to. I want to reiterate what Petri said there. I I, I trade all the futures, um, and you know when the market's moving twelve percent in a day, you think there's money to be made. Truthfully, there's fingers to be lost, um, and my response was exactly the same as Petri's. I reduced my position size by seventy five percent, and increased my criteria for entry quite markedly. So the number of trades I did. Uh, during sort of second half of March and into April is probably a tenth of what I would normally have done. Wild markets, you know, they're great for the movies, but they're not great for traders, hey? not even slightly. Uh, Petri, some questions coming through. What was that first book you mentioned? I tried to grab it as well, but I couldn't get it in time. Oh, um, that was um, Being Right or Making Money. <laughs> being Right or Making Money. Just the title. Yeah, that's cool. the title. It's a cool title. It's, it's, you can choose. You can you can die trying to be right, or you can make money. Yeah, no, I'm and, with you. You know, being right is nice, but I'll, I'll save that for for you know, the rugby games or something like that. Um, a question here. Now, this is going to be the really really hard question. Question about trying to understand what drives gold um, and best to trade it. I mean, is, is gold still certainly in the current environment? Gold is 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 a fear trade, I suspect. Although when the fear, when that fix was at 80, gold was selling off as well, because truthfully at that level, everything goes down. Yeah, so that was actually interesting. And it's something that I'd read before and I'd never actually seen in practice until now, um, is when, you know, when the VIX was at 80 uh, and the market was, you know, falling limit down on the, on the S&P 7% down, yeah. you know, 5% futures down, then the market opens 7% down and we pause again. Like that was wild, right? Um, and what was interesting there is that gold is getting getting sold off very, very hard as well. Um, and I think that's because basically, and it's a discussion that you and I had, Simon, actually, is, is about, um, you know, when the chips are down and people need money, they sell everything. Right? Yeah. There's no, um, now that now that it's kind of settling down a little bit and there's still, you know, significant amounts of fear and disbelief. Uh, going around now we see gold really starting to move as people are sort of rushing into safe havens and rushing into bonds and and, and that kind of stuff for protection right um, so now there's a lot of you know good reason to be long gold but in that sort of really wild time um, it was interesting to see how how gold actually sold off as people just scramble for liquidity right yeah yeah and and, and the thing with gold it is very much a fear trade but but wait for the fear to almost have passed to a degree you know if i know far too many people who've bought gold in the last decade of the view that 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 the world was coming to an end and you know ultimately we can say that they've made money but truthfully they spent nine years biting their fingernails and waiting for something to happen before it actually does uh, a question coming through um, and then I lost it, but uh, let's grab it quickly. Um, how many stocks indices, how many How many are you monitoring, Petri? Is it, you know, do you start at A and run to Z? Do you have a, a defined watch list? Um, so, I mean, I've got, I've got a watch list that just always grows. 
right? Um, depending on the circumstance. So uh, I try to keep an eye, sort of a loose eye on the top 100 companies on the, on the JSE. Stuff smaller than that is is just really not yeah. tradable from a from a speculative perspective. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to to you know have to write articles for newspapers and stuff. And you know what they like is give us a small company, uh, give us a company review, two companies a month, uh, which is really cool because that forces me to look for companies that I know nothing about, study them up, and then write an article about them. Right. Um, so I do that to at least two companies a month. Um, and some of them are, are really nice. I mean, we Jubilee came out there. Um, what yeah, was yeah, it? Very right. Mark was a great one that came out of there. Um, so that's a. Uh, uh, so that's basically yeah. So basically, just the top one hundred stuff, and then also just you know with the, the some of the medical companies and and, and stuff uh, in the U.S. now, um, it's just kind of reacting to what the market's doing. So um, Medtronic, for example, was just a discussion I was having with someone around. Well, you know, someone who makes a vaccine is going to make a lot of money. And then you, you look for a, comp a bunch of companies that, you know, claim to have the vaccine and you see how they do 50%, 100% up in a day. Um, and then you just have to apply a bit of logic and realize, well, nobody's actually going to find a vaccine by next week, Tuesday. So these companies are popping for no reason. But what are people going to need? Okay, you know, the, the main thing that people need in order to treat the coronavirus is ventilators. And it's also the one thing that you know that that there's not enough of and that's why there's such tragic death numbers so who makes ventilators right and then you start searching and searching and searching uh, and just googling stuff really and eventually you come up with like a little list of companies and then you start seeing are they listed are they not da -da -da, da -da -da. Um, and then you dig through the ones that are uh, listed and you look at their charts and you kind of identify opportunities and you start putting things together uh, and just reading articles and stuff. And then eventually you come across something and says, well, you know, Tesla is going to start making ventilators uh, because they were asked to do that by the US government. Um, and then you start thinking, okay, cool. Well, there's only so many ventilator manufacturers that are listed in the US. Um, so, you know, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, one of these. And then you kind of, you know, evaluate from there and sort of drill down and just logically work your way through it. Um, and then eventually you have to take the risk on one of them. Um, well, I like the idea. It's take a trade. the theme that comes up. A year ago, you wouldn't have been looking at medical companies, um, but circumstances change, and, and then it becomes relevant. I also like your your idea of articles, and you reminded me, and I'd completely forgotten this, but but back in the 90s, and, and so, you know, sort of pre-internet almost in a sense, um, that's what I used to do. I, I, I used to I would take a couple of hours every week and, and just go and, and research companies and that would often involve phoning the the investor relations and stuff, but just just building a, a a knowledge base around stocks. And most of the time, you found a company and you did nothing with it. You moved on. But sometimes you found little gems and little gems that you might trade down the line or maybe invest or something. But just building that knowledge. Question coming through Petri around checking in your trades. Now you're in a trade. How often are you checking? And 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 is there a best time to be entering a trade? Or is that going to be price action dependent? Um, okay, so checking the trades, I'll start with that one. Um, I mean, I'm lucky enough to be in a space where I sit in front of my computer all day and this is my job, right? <laughs> so yeah. I'm checking the trades all the time. Me too. Um, <laughs> Probably. You know, so, you know, maybe not consistently looking at them without looking at anything else. I mean, I do look away from time to time, but I'd say I mean, at least 10 or 20 times a day, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think if you were, depending on the time frame that you trade, if you're trading daily, I would check, you know, at the open to see if it opens down 10%, for example, uh, sort of at lunchtime and then at the close, right? That would be a very safe way uh, of doing it. And it's not that high maintenance, um, particularly if you're trading on a daily time frame, then, you know, you often have days before you have to make a decision unless something really drastically happens. Uh, in terms of entry entries, um, I like to trade particularly on the daily stuff and the closing auctions um, because a lot of the time you have to wait for like a level to break uh, before you can take the trade and you can see in the closing auction, okay, it's going to close at 10 Rand 22. My trigger is 10 Rand 20. So if it's going to close there, I'll buy at 10 22 because that's my, my trigger, right? Mm -hmm. um, or sort of early in the morning between that, uh, yeah, it's maybe a bit risky. I like to trade in that first 
couple of, you know, that first hour, it's sometimes a bit of liquid, but sometimes you can get better prices there. Um, so I don't know, entries you could either do in the closing auction or sort of between, I think what would be responsible advice to give would probably say, wait until about 10.30 in the morning before you, you enter into a trade, particularly on a daily time frame, just because by then, uh, that first hour to an hour and a half of price discovery has has taken place, and you know the first half of the trend for the day has has sort of generally been established, and then you can see okay this is you know this is a high probability of working or not. Um, alternatively, like if you trade in that first half an hour, sometimes the spread is really really huge, um, and then you might not necessarily get in at a at a super favorable price, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, or just Put your order in and wait. Just yeah, wait. It's a lot of the time what you need to do. Just put your level in and wait. So here's the question which a lot and of if people you miss it, you miss it, right? A lot of people are asking in different directions, including uh, the, the boss and Paul and others. Um, and I'll take him Paul's because he, he's got a succinct. Are we experiencing a financial crisis worse than the last crash, i.e. 08? Other people saying, are we going back to test the lows? I'll give my five cent version and then we can Take a quick version from Petri. I've got an eye on the time. Um, my view is the worst is not behind us. I think we are, you know, 20 plus a million Americans uh, lost their job in April so far. The UK, whilst presenting, has just extended their lockdown by three weeks. The vaccine for COVID-19 is 2021 at best. Um, I think we've got a lot more bad news to come. And I think the market is overly optimistic in many senses. Um, I, I think there's data that's going to, we're seeing data, and I'll give you, for example, the US jobless claims. Um, you know, the, the previous highest level had been 700,000 odd, in fact, 685, I think, in 2008. Yeah. We're now clapping a, a couple of million per week. If you go look at that chart, and it's from 1967 to date, you know, every, every week until now is just a flat line, and then there's a spike that goes off through the top. This truly is, and I don't say this lightly, this is an epoch moment. This is what is happening in 2020. We, people are going to be talking about for 100 years. Like we still talk about the world wars, we're going to be talking COVID. This is not over, and I think markets have got well ahead of themselves. How do you trade that? Quite simply, price action. Don't, you know, Simon said, and go rush off and short everything. Um, you know, currently they're rising, although I'm short the Aussie. But, you know, I, I, th I think the worst is still to come. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, Simon. I think, um, I mean, I, I, nobody can tell the future, right? We don't, we don't know what happens, and it certainly, um, it certainly helps prop up assets that the the Fed is on the on the bid, right? They just yeah. keep printing ridiculous amounts of money. But I, I think one of the things we, we there was a huge theme when I first sort of started in markets uh, around 2008, 2009. At the time, I had no idea what was happening. I also had no idea the scale of the opportunity that was ahead of me, but um, and, and thus I didn't take it, right? But um, you know, then there was a long talk about kicking the can down the road. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, we've now kicked the can to here. Yeah. And now that it's here, uh, what are we doing? We're printing trillions of dollars. And we're enslaving generations of Americans to the Fed because they have to pay interest on those dollars and they have to pay that debt back. Um, mm -hmm. And they've got to do that by their taxes. Uh, and we're just kicking the can down the road, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. Unless something really, really drastically happens, and I'm talking like an almost complete collapse of the world economy, I don't think that we solve the structural system or systematic problems that there are with the way financial markets are, are working or the world economy is working at this moment and it leads to probably something bigger another hundred years from now down the line right something that our kids kids are going to have to to suffer with um so i don't know i don't know how, how this how this turns out i think we'll be dead long before before you know the end of the current economic system comes about but um at the same time i i also don't think that the current crash if you can call it that um I, I think it's pretty confident i think we can pretty confidently call it that i don't think mm. it's over um i think you know we've had a fairly solid bounce um but i think that if the market makes a v-shaped recovery here there is just there is just nothing that would be logical in that um and, and markets do you know i remember in 08 
you know, because I was on the trading floor at Standard Bank, and I think during that period where ultimately we collapsed 40 to 50% down, I remember easily mm -hmm. a half a dozen, if not more, rallies of 15 to 20%. Um, violent upside rallies in, in, in bear markets are, are absolutely par for the course. Petri, another question coming through, just asking for a quick uh, explanation on, on, on VIX, the, the volatility index, otherwise known as the fear index. So the VIX, I will go to the slide for you as well. So it's the CBOE uh, VIX volatility index. So the Chicago Board of Exchange is where it trades. It is a futures contract uh, that measures the implied, well, that is a tradable sort of contract on the implied volatility of the S&P 500 index. So basically what it does is it looks at the daily sort of volatility of the stuff, highs and lows, uh, how, how much, um, you know, the market moves in any given day and it assigns like a, 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 a the, the math behind it is, is I'll admit, more complicated than I understand. Um, yeah, the but basically it looks at the volatility. Yeah, it's next level, right? Um, but it basically, uh, um, it basically measures the volatility or the implied volatility of the S&P 500 index. Um, so for individual stocks, each individual share or commodity or bond or whatever has its own implied volatility. So, you know, if you take uh, first rand moves two rand up or down in, a, in any given day, so that has uh, as a percentage of its current share price has an implied volatility of, you know, 1%, for example, or 5%. Um, as where if, uh, if it's, you know, 50 rand share and it's moving 10 rand up and down, then implied volatility is significantly higher because right. of the size of the moves that it makes, right? So the bigger and more violent the market becomes, the higher the VIX goes. Uh, and that just basically is a measure of the S&P 500, not necessarily um, of any particular individual stock. And it's typically called the fear index. When VIX is sparking, and you can see the two big spikes in this chart, 08, 2020, when VIX is sparking, that, 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 that's when things are, are tough. Uh, Regan says he's not bearish enough. How can I be more bearish? You know what? Uh, watch the lockdowns being mm -hmm. lifted. So far, only one country's lifted lockdown. Uh, that's China. Can we trust their numbers? I have no idea. But to a country, France, South Africa, uh, uh, you know, Italy, Spain, Portugal, UK, Germany, to a country, lockdowns are being extended, and and you know th th there's good reasons, good health reasons. To me, the issue really is is very much about the 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 this is having a significant economic impact. We 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 can see it in South Africa, we know it, but you know, and maybe in South Africa it's worse because of inequality um, and and the the levels of unemployment we had coming into the crisis. But but make no mistake, I mean, there's talk out there the the. I think it was the Philly Fed or maybe I think it's the Philly Fed. So this isn't a bunch of crackpots. Philadelphia Fed is saying that U.S. unemployment could peak at 42 percent. Understand that in the depression of the 1920s and 30s, U.S. unemployment peaked at 25 uh, percent. Last question coming through from Jacques. Yes, Petri, I'm not sure if you can help here. Uh, I'll give my version. Jacques is saying best entity to use when trading CC or personal name. Jacques, there's, there's pros and cons to both. I trade in my personal name, um, and that means I pay the, 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 the slightly higher tax because of a higher t marginal tax rate. It also depends the tax rate you're in. If you're in a CC, you've got a little more benefit, um, but ultimately, to get the money out of the CC, either you're going to have to declare profit and pay dividends, in which case you're going to pay both company tax and dividend tax, or you're going to pay yourself a salary. So the CC perhaps is, is in a sense, maybe a, a little bit better to, to sort of get some of the, the direct costs. You know, I write off uh, a lot of my expenses. I, I subscribe to um, Business Day Collective and pay, I think, what, 120 bucks a month. And I take that out of my trading expenses um, and SARS is happy with it. It's probably cleaner and easier to do that within a, well, CCs don't exist, PTYs. Uh, if you want uh, AGM tax- If you have a CC, you. you're quite lucky, yeah. Yeah, if you've got a CC, <laughs> hang on to it because they, they're great things. Petri, I don't know if you have a, a preference or a thought, either CC or personal. I think, you know, that's a, it's a question that often comes up. Should I, do a, should I do a company structure or a trust structure or whatever the case is, oh, right? don't do trust. They're um, terrible. They, fees are horrendous. Yeah. Trusts were great in the it, 80s. It depends. Yeah, it, it depends entirely on um, the size of the capital base that you're working with, right? If it's, <laughs> if you're making less than a million a year trading, 
you know, there's no, I'd, I'd wager if you're making less than 2 million a year trading, there's no real reason um, to do it through any other structure other than your personal capacity. Because sure, you might save on tax, but like Simon mentions, getting the money out of the entity is really tough. Um, so that kind of forces you now to start living your life within this, this company structure. So the company owns the house, the company owns the car, the company owns all the stuff, right? Um, yes. So yeah, it really depends on, on um, how much you're earning and what the income, what the nominal income tax rate is and where you would be more, you know, where it would be more beneficial for you from a tax perspective. Um, and unfortunately the number to, for it to make sort of economic sense uh, for you to do it through companies is very big. Yeah. Um, so happened over nine the, out of ten times it's better to just do it in your personal capacity. Yeah, over the last twenty, thirty years, SARS has closed every single loophole. The you know, in the olden days, this versus that, and there was often a clear distinction that one was better than the other. Um that that's no longer the case. Petri, can you pop back to your last slide, which is the Sacia Bonga? Uh, we've done the questions. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time. Uh, what Petri didn't mention, although he pulled the slide, he's uh, got a website called saciabonga.coza. And what this is, is to try and help small businesses. So, you know, the, the coffee shop where you used to buy coffee or the baker you used to buy your, your lunch from or something is currently experiencing zero revenue and they still have costs. So if you are the baker or the coffee shop, you can log on to Saciabonga and sell vouchers forward that someone gives you some cash flow now but will come pick the coffee up in a couple of months. Uh, inversely, if you were buying from a, a small provider, um, perhaps pop along, see if they're there, and uh, you can go in and help their cash flow at this moment because, as I say, uh, it, is, it, is, it is dark out there and it's really, really hard. Petri, presentation was excellent. Always appreciate your time. Ladies and gents, again, apologies for delaying last week, but really appreciate you all giving your time again this week. We've got... Two more power hours coming end of May. Um, they're probably going to all be webcasts for a long time longer. Uh, one will be Keith McLaughlin. I'm going to get him to talk around balance sheets. And we'll get a second up. Everyone, really appreciate your time. Stay safe. Have a good evening.